Welcome to Night Common Ground. Uh, we are looking at the uh, Feast of God, and tonight we're on the fourth feast. It's the last of the spring feast, and so Alan is not here, as you can tell, uh, much better looking uh, up here, uh, but uh, sorry, Alan. Uh, but anyway, um, a couple days ago, he was informed by his son that his grandson was graduating from kindergarten tonight. So uh, he is going to see his, his, his uh, um, grandson, Liam, graduate from kindergarten. So we're, he's gone. Uh, Angie was already heading to Nashville, I believe, so she was upset because uh, she had prior uh, engagements and all that. But anyway, um, we are happy to, to, you know, Alan can get away and, and uh, see that important event in his grandson's life. So anyway, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we'll open with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll be led by Melody and accompanied by Melanie um, with tonight, okay? That was hard to say there. It's a tongue twister, you know what I'm saying? All right, let's pray. God, thank you again so much for this night. I thank you, Lord. Um, our campus is a little sparser tonight than from last night and the weeks prior because we don't have children running around. Uh, one is now done, but yet, Lord, we have other groups meeting. Our high school uh, folks are meeting as well. So, God, we just ask that um, that you would just um, in, in just come over this whole uh, campus, and that you would just envelop each classroom, each group that is meeting. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to hearts and that you would open minds and hearts to your word and to uh, your spirit. And Lord, I pray that we would, uh, for being here, we would be changed. As our pastor says quite often, um, this day, this time is unique. There'll be no other time like it, no other time where these same people at this same time on this same day will ever meet again. And so you have um, ordained this time for each one of us. And so, God, may we just be receptive to what you have for us tonight. And, God, we thank and we praise you already for what you're going to do. So, Lord, we just lift this time up to you as we pray or as we uh, sing, as we offer our voices in worship. I pray it would be pleasing unto you. And just ask your blessings upon this time, Lord, I pray. And, and I ask it all in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Melody, would you please lead us? Amen. Yes, I will. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we are going to sing about the Trinity tonight. Now, do you all stand or do you stay seated? Okay, you just sit right there. Here we go. Father, Father,
Thank you, ladies, for helping us out there in the absence of Alan. <clears throat> All right, we're looking at uh, the Feast of Weeks uh, or the Feast of Pentecost. We'll get into that here in a second. But uh, 50 days after Passover, Shavuot, or, I'm sorry, Shavuot, Shavuot, I know I get it right, Shavuot, right? is celebrated. Uh, Shava is Hebrew for seven. Shavuot is the plural or sevens. Seven sets of seven. In English, we would say it's a week of weeks or it is seven weeks. And then we add one day because the feast is on the day after the seventh Sabbath. We're going to look at a passage in Leviticus here in a moment. Um, we also know this as the Feast of Weeks. As I said, the Feast of Harvest and the latter first fruits. If you don't have a listening guide, you can get one over there. Help yourself if you have not got one already. Uh, and for those of you who are watching online, you can find a listening guide uh, on our website. Just follow the links, uh, and you can get you a, a PDF of that as well. Um, it is a time, though, that's set aside to present an offering of new grain for the a summer wheat harvest to the Lord. The feast is also known, as we just said, Pentecost. Uh, in Greek, the word Pentecost means 50. All right, that's applicable. So the, uh, the days from Passover to Shavuot are counted at weekly Sabbath services. Special foods are usually a part of this holiday. Dairy foods such as cheesecake, uh, cheese blintzes, 
Uh, anyone know what blintzes are? Okay, we have one person. Know what, uh, the law is compared to milk and honey. Uh, cheese blintzes are of Jewish uh, origin. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and are thin pancakes traditionally filled with sweetened cheese or the addition of raisins. Now, uh, the farmer's cheese can be far found, as I was looking uh, in some of the descriptions of it and the explanations of it, I read that the farmer's cheese is hard to find outside of Ukraine. And that just kind of brings things to uh, current day and what's happening in Ukraine. So uh, often that cheese is replaced with ricotta or cottage cheese, cream cheese, uh, mascarpone, or uh, there's a French name of that cheese. I ain't going to mention it because I'll butcher it, all right? The word blintz in English comes from a Yiddish word that means pancake, all right? Pancake. So modern blintzes now have a variety of fillings and toppings, and homes and synagogues are decorated with flowers, greenery, represents the harvest time, and the Torah as the tree of life. So observant Jews often spend the night reading and studying the Torah. Traditionally, they read from Ezekiel chapter 1. I think I listed in the listening guide some of the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, uh, which mentions that that holiday, this feast. Um, uh, I need to mention, uh, it, in the Jewish mind, there is no Old Testament. Okay, it is just God's testament. All right, because they don't look to the New Testament as God's word. All right. Anyway, we're going to first look at counting days. That's what they do. They count the days, and it's the this is as I said at the beginning. This is the fourth and final feast of the spring. Okay, there are seven feasts. This is the final feast of spring. It is the fourth feast. Uh, the feast of weeks is given to Hebrew people in Leviticus chapter twenty-three. If you watch in the listening guide, look in the listening guide there, you'll read: "You are to count seven complete weeks, starting from the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the presentation offering. You are to count fifty days until the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord." So this feast is the same feast celebrated uh, in the New Testament, but it's described as the Feast of Pentecost, and there was a transition in the descriptions. But in the Feast of Weeks, God gave His law to the people. You know, as slaves in Egypt, they were told what they could and couldn't do. As a slave, you have to listen to your master, right? And so as slaves in Egypt, they were told what they couldn't do by the Egyptian slave masters. In their new life as free people, they needed guidance from their new master, Yahweh. And so the law was not uh, the, a price of freedom, but it was a way for people to respond to God and His grace in moving them as they were set free. The Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost, uh, the people celebrate God's provision for life. It was celebrated in the middle of wheat harvest. Uh, a new grain offering was to be made to God in the Feast of Weeks. Interesting now, we notice in, uh, uh, we will notice in, in this feast, leaven is now introduced to the bread uh, in place of unleavened bread that was used in the previous three feasts, right? So now why is leaven allowed? According to some Messianic Jews, they indicate that while Passover is referring to God and the purging of sin, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost refers to God's people who received the law and the Spirit. The day of the law came down from God, and that was actually the first, day of Pente the first Pentecost, the first one, when they received the law. Of course, uh, on that first time, what happened? After they received the Ten Commandments or even before they even, Moses brought them down, what happened? They, yes, they, they, uh, they strayed. They made a golden calf to worship. So how did God respond? Well, if we see in Exodus chapter 32, the Levites did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 men fell dead that day among the people. 3,000 were slain for their, un uh, their sinful acts um, on the day that the law was given. We still have that sin nature today, don't we? We still have it. Um, we will continue to have it until we have our glorified bodies. One other point. The day that Peter preached on Pentecost, how many souls were saved? <laughs> it's already in your listening, guys, so you already know the answer. But in Acts 2.41, those accepted the message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. 3,000. Interesting, isn't it? 
That was the new remnant that God always makes sure he has. Always has a remnant that remains. In Leviticus chapter 23, we read, Bring two loaves of bread from your settlements as a presentation offering, each each of them made from four quarts of fine flour baked with yeast as first fruits to the Lord. So we see uh, uh, leaven is now allowed to be introduced in the baking. So looking at things from the New Testament perspective, these loaves represent the church. If so, why two loaves? Again, according to Messianic Jews, the two loaves provide a picture of both Jews and Gentiles who now are a part of the church of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10. Because there is one bread, we who are many are only one body, since all of us share the one bread. The two lo- loaves mentioned in Leviticus are now one body, one loaf representing Jew and Gentile. Now there were many other offerings and sacrifices that were made at the temple according or applicable to various sins and, and, and thanksgivings. Uh, but we'll move on. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the Omer, okay? Um, now you might be thinking, what is that? The Omer, O-M-E-R. There, can you see that there? All right. Now according to Leviticus 23, a passage where we read, God told the Jews to begin counting 50 days from the day of the Feast of first fruits to the next feast, the Feast of Weeks, or what we know as the Feast of Pentecost. They called, they called the counting of the 49 days the counting of the Omer. Now, the Omer was an ancient Jewish unit of dry measure or volume of grains or, or dry commodities. So they were counting those. So during the 49 days, the wheat crop is in the ripening process. At the end of the Omer count, the crop is ready for harvest, and the first fruits of the wheat crop can be brought to the temple at Pentecost on the 50th day. This then concludes the festival or feast for the spring. Remember the first uh, spring festival or feast was Passover, right? So just as the feast of first fruits celebrates the ripening of the barley uh, grain crop, Shavuot represents or celebrates the ripening of the wheat crop. And so there is kind of a remembrance and there is a comparison that I'd like to look at here. I got this out of one of the commentaries. Is it in your, is it in your listening guide? I forget whether I put it in there. It's a, it's a quote from a man named Michael Norton, okay? Let me read that. The feasts have all historical significance. The Feast of Passover is a remembrance of the slaying of the Passover lamb. The feast day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a remembrance of the exodus from Egypt. The Feast of Weeks is a remembrance of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. The seventh day after Passover, according to tradition, reminds Jews of the crossing of the Red Sea. The counting of the Omer is regarded as a remembrance of the intervening days between exodus from Egypt and the revelation at Sinai. That is why the Feast of Weeks become or became known as the anniversary of God's appearance at Mount Sinai. So, remembering, comparing, the first thing we want to look at is the law. That was the, what was given, that was the, the Feast of Weeks. Exodus 20 again, all right? All the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the ram's horn, and the mountain surrounded by smoke. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Now, we talked last week about the Hebrew Midrash, right? Remember what that is? It's a collection of Jewish oral traditions, commentaries on Scripture, okay? Uh, what we know as the Old Testament. It's not canonized. It's not, it's not been looked at, and it's not looked at as, as the Word of God. It is the Word of man um, talking about um, some oral traditions and talking about um, Scripture itself. However, the Midrash does speak of when the people saw God moving. And in that account, it is noted that the people saw sound waves in the form of fiery substances, which eventually rested on each person, and that they heard God in many languages. This is in the Old Testament. This is when the law was given. Look at Exodus 19.16. On the third day when morning came, there was thundering and lightning, thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, a very loud blast from a ram's horn, so that all the people in the camp shuddered. That's the law. Now we look ahead and we, we want to look at the Spirit, right? Acts 2. We're going to try to do some comparisons here, right? Look at verse, chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. 
Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Now, there's no way that we can be certain of what is recorded in the Midrash is actually happening. I'm not here to say that we can say that that did happen, what I just read earlier. But there is a strong probability that those in the room, as recorded in Acts, had in their mind, because they were students of the law, of what made the connection between what they read in, in Revelation, the relation of the Feast of Weeks, to what they experienced on the day of Pentecost. All right, the Holy Spirit came. That's what we celebrate. That's what, that's what we, the gift that we have. Um, before we go too far, though, let me just clarify one thing or state that there is, uh, we don't, as Baptists, don't believe that the Scripture teaches a, a second baptism in the Holy Spirit. Some denominations teach that all Christians are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the baptism in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this second baptism, the believer will have a special power to enable them to have things and do things they cannot have and they cannot do on their own. Okay? Now, this would include speaking in tongues, and that the, the teaching is that everyone should have the second baptism and be able to speak in tongues. That goes against Scripture uh, in, the, in, the, in the giving of gifts. Um, it would also include the current thought and belief of the name it and claim it theology. You know, when I believe this is what God is telling me, I name it, I claim it as it's mine, and God's got to do what I say he's got to do. That's just, um, I don't believe that is, um, that is scriptural, okay? If it is not that, then what does the Holy Spirit do as it relates to human beings? That needs to be the question then. The concept of the filling of the Spirit has always evoked different opinions regarding its meaning. I'd like to look at two primary ways that we receive the Holy Spirit and how we relate to the Holy Spirit, or how the Holy Spirit relates to us. I should probably, that's a better way of saying it. The first one is guidance. There are clear examples of God giving guidance to his people through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led Jesus through the wilderness. The Holy Spirit told Philip to join a man in his chariot. He told Peter to go with three men who came to him from Cornelius' home. As a church, the Holy Spirit directed them to set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work he called them to do. We see the Holy Spirit moving in a compelling way with humans. Look at Acts chapter 8. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him any longer. In 1 Kings chapter 18, but when I leave you, the Spirit of the Lord may carry you off to some place I don't know. When I go, then when I go to report to Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Then in Ezekiel, chapter 43, Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Of course, when we read in Revelation, we remember these verses if you've been a student of Revelation. Revelation chapter 17, John Revelator. Then he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And then in the 21st chapter, he then carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. So uh, there are many instances that we see in Scripture where there is this uh, enabling uh, from the Spirit. Of course, the vast majority of the time, the Holy Spirit guides us in far less dramatic ways. I don't know that we've been, uh, as in Philip, Philip, not this Philip, the Philip from Scripture, okay, uh, was there and then phew, gone, all right? I don't know that anyone's... That could happen. It could, I'm not denying it can't happen. God can do anything. But... For us, common folk, okay, I mean, has anyone been carried away in the Spirit, gone from here to there, transported? No, not yet? Okay. Uh, we may, we... <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Moving right along. 
for most of us, the Holy Spirit moves in our lives in far less dramatic ways, but he still moves. A few verses related to this type of guidance can be found in Romans 8. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's Son. So there's a leading of the Spirit in our lives. Galatians 5. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So again, there's this, this leading that we see. Romans 8. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there's this walking, this leading. So we we walk in the Spirit. uh, And we're going to expound on that here in a minute. But these verses instruct us to uh, to allow the Holy Spirit's leading in our life. And then our walk should be according to what God desires in our life. Our walk should be according to the precepts taught in Scripture. Yes, but we should also receive guidance through the Holy Spirit in matters that, um, that may not be in clear black and white in, in, um, in God's Word. And, and I, maybe you've had those experiences where you've asked God's leading and He's given you direction one way or the other. It's not an easy thing. God doesn't speak to us through a bullhorn. Anybody heard God through a bullhorn? No, no. He speaks to us in a still, small voice. And we must pay attention. Learn that still, small voice. Seek to hear him and learn how he speaks to us. And I'm I'm thinking he speaks to us very differently sometimes to each one of us. We also must fight our sin nature. It doesn't help us, as Paul indicates in Galatians 5. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. This is a few verses here, so just bear with me, okay? For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. Can I get a witness? Okay? But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and then he adds, and anything similar. (laughs) He wants to make sure that, not me, not me, not me, not me, I guess that doesn't cover me. Well, anything similar, okay? That way it covers all of us, okay? Um, I am warning you about these things. Uh, where am I at? I'm war- As I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, now, have we heard this before? <laughs> For those of you who have been coming to Common Ground, these should be familiar words. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So Paul lays out these contrasts and desires. The Spirit versus the flesh. And that implies that we should be seeking direction from the Spirit in every moment. As we study God's Word, we understand more and more uh, where and what the differences are. But as the case in most situations or in most things, there are gray areas. There are things that Scripture does not address. And that is when we need the Spirit's direction the most. Acts chapter 15. Let me give you a couple examples. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and, and, and ours not to place further burdens on you beyond those requirements. So this is something that's outside of Scripture, but um, the Holy Spirit is giving them guidance. In Acts chapter 16, they went through the region. Uh, well, they had, uh, when they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. In both these cases, it became evident to the people as to what and where God was directing them through the Holy Spirit speaking to their hearts. Paul didn't find God's principle where he commanded people not to pre- preach in Asia or Bithynia. 
He didn't read that somewhere. He, God spoke it to him through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided them in sp- some specific way. We're not told which way, but some way. God gave them instruction, you're not to go there. So we see that God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit in a variety of ways to give us directions in what we are to do, what we are to say. We must be willing to humble ourselves then to put our desires behind what God desires for us and then listen closely for His instructions. And when we do listen and when we act, He gives us something. He gives us power. God calls us to do God-sized tasks and goals. God is not going to call you to do something that you can do in your sleep, okay? Something that's very easy to you. Why? Why do you think that is? Yeah. If it's something very easy that you do all the time, then look what I did. Look what I did. Look what I did. If it's something that is beyond your abilities and God has called you to do it, he empowered you to do it, then what it said? Look what God did through me. God then gets the glory, not us. Of course, we see God's empowerment in the New Testament beginning with Jesus. And look at Matthew chapter 3. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. He received the Holy Spirit. He's communed with the Holy Spirit. Luke 4. When Jesus left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So he continued to receive uh, instructions and leading from the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, um, the 14th verse in that same chapter. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. Jesus possessed God's power through the Holy Spirit. Jesus did miraculous things while he walked the earth, and the Spirit was pleased to dwell in him and empower him. Because Jesus delighted the Holy Spirit through his absolute moral and pure holy life. John chapter 3. For the one whom God sent speaks God's word, since he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given him all things into into his hands. The Holy Spirit doesn't just stop with Jesus, all right? He empowered his disciples for ministry. Throughout the book of Acts, we read of the disciples preaching performing, and performing miracles in the name of Christ. The Holy Spirit does the same thing for us today. We can do God-sized things with God's power given to us through the Holy Spirit. One way of empowering us today is through the giving of spiritual gifts to equip us for ministry. Now, if you've attended Common Ground for any length of time, uh, you have heard us walk through the spiritual gifting and through the fruit of the Spirit, all right? Both are indications of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the life of a church. We are uh, in a spiritual war, and we need the armaments that God gives us uh, as He gives them to us. The power we receive and the giftedness we operate under is something that is not to be taken advantage of or or taken for granted. God gives us those things not to make our lives easier or to make us more prestigious amongst our peers, uh, but rather to advance His kingdom, His glory throughout the land. We are better for it, yes, but never to advance our worldly, our carnal nature. It's always to bring glory to God the Father. All right, let's, let's kind of wrap this up here. What are some things that we can apply to our lives? And I, the first thing I'd like to mention, I, I call it life and death. God used this feast, the Feast of Weeks, a Feast of Pentecost, to show us life and death. As I studied and prepared for this, you know, that passage just kept coming in my mind, and I'd like to share with you, my heart went to what Moses did as he called his people Uh, for God. In Deuteronomy we read this, See today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. For I'm commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commands, statutes and ordinances, so that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess. 
But if your heart turns away and you do not listen, and you are led astray to bow and worship to other gods and serve them, I will tell you today that you will certainly perish and will not prolong your days in the land you are entering to possess across the Jordan. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Love the Lord your God, obey him and remain faithful to him, for he is your life. And he will prolong your days as you live in the land the Lord swore to give you, to, swore to give to your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the Feast of Weeks, God presented to the people the way of life. He then gave them freedom um, and the law, which gave them a guide to which to live by. But the law showed them that death was the only option. Because when they tried to live out a righteous life on their own, according to the law, what happened? They failed. They failed. But he gave them a second option, choosing life by obeying God and loving him and using the method of covering their sins through the blood of animals. That was only temporary. There needed to be a complete sacrifice as we humans need help to live for God. So God gave us Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away all sin forever. And with the Feast of Pentecost, we receive the Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us to life eternal. And now, now we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there, na there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He, con he condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. So after the Feast of Pentecost, we now live with God in us. <laughs> we are now His temple. The Holy Spirit is on us and in us. The law could not bring us righteousness because we are weakened by our flesh, our sin nature. So what we could not do, God did by giving us His Son and Himself through the Holy Spirit. It is more than coincidence that these first four feasts marked a momentous outpouring of God in one year, really just a few months. Jesus was crucified on Passover. He was buried on unleavened bread. He was raised on first fruits. And he sent us the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, the first four feasts. But we must give the Holy Spirit control. That's up to us. If we're to fully enjoy the gift of Pentecost in our lives, then we must totally surrender to the Holy Spirit. In the Greek language, there are two different words for the process of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at them real quickly. Ephesians 5.18. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for filling here conveys the idea of growth to maturity or being molded by 
the Holy Spirit. It is in the present tense, so that means it's a continual process. It doesn't stop. We are to be filled or generously supplied with the Holy Spirit continually as we live and breathe. It's something that we should always seek from God, an ever-increasing amount. And then in Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell among you. That word dwell, has, is, this is a different word with the same subject at hand. The Greek word translated dwell means to inhabit or live in. Again, it's a continual thing. We're to let the word of Christ inhabit in our soul. In both cases, we are essentially put on, uh, we are to, to really to put on Christ, as, as Paul talked about. To allow the Spirit and the Word to overtake ourselves in a, a continually increasing way, so that more and more as people see us, they don't see us, they see us less and less, and they see what? Jesus more and more. Acts 2 4. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Here, the word tense for filled indicates a single event, a happening. This is why I don't believe that everyone must speak in tongues if you come to, to, to know Christ as Lord and Savior, this second baptism. In this case, in, in lot, they point to this, okay, as being able to speak in tongues. This was a one-time occurrence based on the Greek language. It conveys an empowering of the Holy Spirit for a work of service. So with both verb tenses for dwell or fulfilling, we see that the Holy Spirit is or should be a constantly uh, ever-increasing presence in our life. At any time when we need it, He is there to empower us on a case-by-case basis as we need, as we read about here in in Acts chapter 2, 4. Now, I've said this before. We often look to the Holy Spirit for direction when we consider these big things in life, all right, these big decisions, these big things that we face. When in reality, we're to give the Holy Spirit control in all matters of our life. I think I've said it before. I mean, down to, I'm going to the grocery store. Should I go to Publix or should I go to Winn-Dixie? Allow the Spirit to direct us. We think we're going for groceries, right? But maybe God has set apart of an appointment that we're going to see somebody where we can share Christ or somebody that's hurting, where we can wrap our arms around them, giving them a word of comfort and care. See what I'm saying? Even in the little things of life, we need to allow the Spirit to speak to our hearts and so that because these divine appointments aren't maybe we're made, we aren't aware of. It, God, we're going for something, but God has us going there for something else, something far greater. When He calls us to do something, remember He will empower us. He'll direct us to get it done for His glory. Finally, lastly, we live under the harvest of Pentecost still. As we'll see next week, the next feast has not come to fruition as it relates to prophecy. We still live under the orders of Pentecost. We're continuing this this spring crop or moving into summer crop. John 4, don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. Then in Matthew 9, Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. We are in the spring harvest of Pentecost right now, spiritually speaking. It's still happening. We are called to fill the role of worker as described by Jesus in Matthew 9. I'm so thankful that we are part of Ascending Church. We have in our midst people who feel called to go, some for extended periods of time, like, like Joy just left. We were just talking to Melody. You know, Joy just left for, for a year, at least a year. Um, uh, we have the Eubanks that served in Africa for an extended period of time several years ago. Over the years, we've sent many people out on short-term mission projects. We have another one scheduled for this summer. However, we must never forget that there is a growing mission field where? 
right here in Suwannee County. We now have Julio to lead us in reaching Spanish-speaking people in this community, in this area. But we all have neighbors, we have friends, co-workers, um, maybe family. We all have people around us that we come in contact with on a daily basis who need to know Christ. Let's not forget them either. Allow the Holy Spirit to direct and empower you to be a witness to them. It's great that we send people out. That's great. But there's a mission field. There's a harvest to be gleaned here in this county. The entire Godhead was involved in fulfilling the spring feasts as we conclude. The Son honored and fulfilled the feast of Passover by his death the Feast of Unleavened Bread through his burial. The Father honored and fulfilled the Feast of first fruits by raising up Christ from death and the grave. And then the Holy Spirit honored and fulfilled the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost, by his descent 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. It's up to us now to respond to the fulfilling of the work of the Godhead by serving the Lord in power, and in truth. Let's pray. God, thank you for these, this study. I thank you for this, the fourth uh, feast that we've looked at. We've looked at what it means to the Hebrew people, to the Jewish people. Uh, we're going to continue looking at that in the next uh, uh, few weeks. But Lord, there is also the spiritual aspect, there's the prophetic aspect, which point people to Christ, to the Godhead, and so, Lord, uh, as we look at these feasts, let us not forget that the Feast of Pentecost is still among us. We are still involved, or we should be, because the fields are widened to harvest. The next feast is a prophetic one that has not taken place, the Feast of Trumpets. And one day, the trumpet of God will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised. And that, from that moment on, um, the judgment will come. So God, as we are in the time of harvest, may we be found faithful. The time of Pentecost, knowing that the Holy Spirit gives us what we need to witness, to be examples to those around us of who Jesus is. May our lives be, in, we, we live our lives in such a way that people say there's something different about that person. And then they have the power or the, 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 uh, the strength to come up and say, you're different, why? And that would give us then the, uh, the, uh, the privilege of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to that person. So God, may we continue to live in the way that we should live, growing in our relationship with you uh, uh, through your word and through your spirit, allowing you to have control in our lives. And may we, may we take advantage of, of where you lead us. And you do lead us. And we take advantage of that, Lord, in being an example and a witness of who you are and your love for those around us. Thank you, God, for these feasts. Thank you for those who are in tenants, Lord. Keep us uh, until we meet again, Lord, and we ask it all in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.